The enthusiasm is infectious. So thank you uh, for doing what you do, John. Uh, let me start by asking you about your journey at Cisco because you've got so many young people here, young entrepreneurs, uh, who would like to hear how you've gone. And, I, and John's just uh, released his book, by the way. It's called Connecting the Dots. It's out, uh, out uh, in front, so if you want to grab a copy, and I'm sure he'd be happy to sign one for you as well. So let me quote uh, from John's book. He says, we focused relentlessly on outcomes. You don't buy 180 companies, pioneer new business models like outsourcing, move from one business to 18 different product lines, grow headcount from 400 employees to more than 70,000, and increase annual sales from 70 million to 47 billion dollars if you don't embrace the future. You also can't survive a near-death experience, multiple market shifts, technology disruptions, and some bad bets if you don't don't learn from your past and build a great team and a strong culture. What an amazing journey it's been for you, John. But what would you crystallize as being the key to your success in the marketplace? I learned the hard way that market transitions are what you have to focus on. And while I always like to talk about the good transitions, it's also how you handle your setbacks. I learned growing up in a state in West Virginia that got left behind. It was the coal center of the world and the chemical center of the world. Then I went to Boston, Route 128 with MIT there. We were the Silicon Valley of the world for three decades. And because we didn't change, Silicon Valley took off. I learned by being in mainframes at IBM, many computers at Wang, then to the PC, to the internet, you must move ahead of the market transitions. And if you do it right, you have a chance to lead in that area. But my view is you never compete against competitors. That's the way you keep score. Mm. You compete about getting the market transitions right. And Shireen, what we often do in sessions like this, we talk about our successes. And you were very kind to mention a number of those. And we were the best at acquiring. And we were fearless about moving into new markets. And we never had a competitor to get above 20% market share in our target markets out of 18 of them that we went after. But what will be a lesson for each of you, and I always try to put myself in your spot, I would argue we were as much a product of how we handled the disruptions mm. or the disasters as we were the successes. Jack Welch taught me that. So how we went through the challenges and how we took the criticism when we did our first acquisition, which most people thought was a mistake, ended up being a $13 billion market force per year. How when we got knocked on our tail in the dot-com bubble 2001, it was my hardest year ever as a CEO, but Jack Welch said at the end of it, it was probably my best year. I said, Jack, you're the only one that ever said that, <laughs> and he was the only one that ever did. But he was right. It's when you develop your character as a leader, it's when you as startups go through those challenges, and most startups and most big companies, when they really get knocked down hard, and never get back up. So it's market transitions, mm -hmm. it's learning from experience, it's constantly, if I have a talent, it might be identifying the market transitions by pattern recognition okay. and then connecting the dots mm -hmm. and then building a great team that what focuses on What has to do it. that? Um, I think it's the lessons of the past. It's watching what happens when you don't, and then I love to compete, almost to a fault, and I love to build great teams, and that's what I'm doing my current uh, role, is building great startups that have the potential to dominate their segment of the industry. And so for me, it's listening constantly. Mm. Uh, I'm in a business-to-business -business environment most of the time. I can be okay at business-to-consumer, but business-to-business, -business, I listen to the customers. They help us identify the trends ahead of time, and you've got to listen constantly. Uh, an example would be in switching, we were a routing company, and all of a sudden, for motor companies, said there's this new technology called Ethernet switching. It isn't so important, the technology here. It's the takeaway. And I got it. I had them explained to me a week later. I was at Boeing. They said, there's new technology. And I mm. said, yeah, Ethernet switching. Can I have your order, please? And they said, no, goodbye, company. And that was how I did my first acquisition. So it's listening all the time to trends and then taking the products that we get passionate about and focusing on outcomes. GDP growth, uh, the ability to change business models, mm -hmm. the ability to change society in a positive way. So, you know, since you're talking about connecting the dots and you're looking at the past to be able to predict the future, or at least build together a pattern for the future, what excites you about what you're seeing today? Not just in India, but globally. And what are the key trends that people should watch out for? Well, both the excitement and the key trends to watch out for are in parallel. Uh, the excitement is it's going to be a digital world 
and every company and every business and every government agency will be a technology capability, whether you're in uh, a defense or whether you're in retail or healthcare. And what also excites me is with this digital world, it's going to move with tremendous speed, and it'll cause us to live longer. It will cause us to be dramatically more productive, preferably a standard living. The challenge is the disruption is going to be brutal. 40% of the large companies are going to disappear in the next decade. Digitization combined with artificial intelligence will destroy 20 to 40% of the jobs. It's going to become a startup world. And that was the, one of the reasons I wrote the book. It was about if we don't dramatically change the pace of startups, like you're doing here in India, mm. uh, you're not going to be able to employ the 1.2 million people that come into the market each month or in the U.S. The ability to generate 250 to 300,000 jobs yeah. per month as well. And that's before you take into those that have been put out by the new technology. Mm. So what excites me is how this is starting to be a startup world and how India, I would say for the first time, is becoming a innovation leader. It's remarkable how your government leaders, and I'm a huge Prime Minister Modi fan because of his vision, his strategy, and how he executes off of it, and how he and his team are blowing away the hurdles in areas such as how small companies can grow bigger, and we're making progress. Mm -hmm. uh, huge improvement, as you saw, on the ease of doing business, moving in four years from 142 to 77. But what excites me most is you all, and I don't want to put any pressure on you, but you are the future of this country. Your large companies will not add headcount over the next decade. How well you do this is a window of opportunity. Do you become the Silicon Valley of the future, which I think you can, and Shereen, tremendous compliment to you. You've helped to be one of the players who believed in this before it became obvious to others, but you only get this opportunity once. And so the key is can you scale as a group? Mm. And it's fun watching India move from what I would call, and please don't misinterpret my terms, following the U.S. lead, almost cloning some of the U.S. major companies, to now you're starting to see India lead with new technology, both in enterprise and consumer, and an example for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So if I've been in one country in the world, it's this country. I think you'll do 10% GDP growth, and I think you'll become the startup country for the world if you execute. It's not a given. To your point earlier, no entitlement. No entitlement, and it boils down to execution, and it boils down to scale, which brings me uh, to ask you the question, John, that, you know, you talk about speed, and you talk about the ability to deliver on scale with speed. Now, you, you've put this replicable playbook in place at Cisco, which you uh, sort of relied on to be able to pull off on each of the bets that you made. What's the criteria? What's the, what are the, what's the secret sauce as far as the, the playbook is concerned to ensure that you can act with speed and at scale? Perhaps if you don't take anything away from the concepts I was trying to teach in the book, and, and I didn't want to write a book. I thought somebody could write it about me when I was dead, and I'm dyslexic. I don't like writing. It was very painful, but I saw the same questions in New Delhi or in New York or uh, uh, Silicon Valley or Dubai in terms of what the young companies wanted to know and also what the big companies wanted to know because they now realize they have to both partner with startups and act like it. The key takeaway is identify market transitions mm. and then develop a replicatable innovation playbook for almost everything you do. So we developed a playbook for acquiring that is taught today in the schools, and I just taught it on Friday at Stanford with Safra Katz, the president of Oracle, where here are the six steps that you follow in terms of how do you decide to acquire and why did Cisco acquire 180 companies, two-thirds of which are successful mm. in the acquisitions and exceeded our expectations in a market where 90% fail. How do you develop a replicatable playbook for digitization and how do you put that in place in a way that you can work with the President of France, President Macron, I'm the French Tech High Tech Ambassador, or with uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi, and I had the honor to be with him uh, two days ago, literally talking about startups and the directions and a one-on-one -on -one session with him uh, on what we could do even more in India. So the ability to develop that replicatable playbook, including which companies do I invest in and how do I do it in startups and how do I get them grow, I used to think is bureaucracy. And it's the reverse. It allows you to move with speed. And let me give you an example. I could get a call on a Thursday night from the head of NASDAQ and said, John, you're an idiot. And I said, Al, I know that, but what, what topic? And he said, you should be acquiring this company. And I was really embarrassed. I didn't even know the name of the company. And then he said, your competitors have been in there for six to 12 months. It's public knowledge. John, you're slipping. And of course, he was teasing me. Uh, he was saying, get, get off the chair and go, yeah. go look at them. Yeah. 
Friday morning, I had my head of business development talking to the CEO of that company. He called me up after an hour and said, John, you get to get over here. In an hour and a half, we had an agreement that I was going to acquire the company for $3.2 billion. We put it through both board of directors through the weekend. We aligned up everybody for the announcement Monday morning, and we announced it, and it was a tremendous success, not just in the short term, long term. No other company in the world could do that. Why do we do it? First, fearless understood how important market transitions are, but it's that replicatable innovation playbook. Mm -hmm. And I encourage you all to do that, whether it's as simple as your vision and strategy, where you make your investments, how do you handle your setbacks, and they are inevitable how you deal with them, or how literally you recruit people, or how when you lose somebody, instead of just saying, can we keep you here, Shireen, and you say, no, I've got twice the amount of money mm -hmm. and a better title, and is there anything I can do to change your mind, and you say no, uh, and then thank you. Shoot, when somebody started to leave Cisco, we put a full court press on, replicatable playbook, and probably 75% of my leaders left at one point in time, and yet we kept them. So instead of being bureaucracy, it actually is the speed of innovation. Okay, that, that's a good point. But, you know, you did 180 acquisitions. A lot of people in this room are probably look probably on the cusp of being acquired, if not today, at some point. Yes. What is it that they should keep in mind while looking at strategic partnership as, as well as the possibility of, of being acquired by a global company or a domestic large Indian company as well? So four questions, breaking them down in the sequence you raised them. Uh, the first one is you want to decide your exit strategy, you're most likely. And uh, somewhere between 55 to 60 percent of the startups around the world, their exit strategy is to be acquired. Uh, secondly, you've got to say what is that you're going to do differently to position yourself to be acquired. And when you think about it, you're going to first go, who gives me the best financial decision? That's a huge mistake. When you look at which company you want to be acquired by, if you really care about your products and your people long term, you want to pick a company that has a very similar view where your industry is going to go mm. and what role you're going to play within it. In other words, the role they're after. You want to pick a company that has a similar culture. Because if they don't have a similar culture, your people aren't going to stay. You want to pick a company where this is really going to be very strategically important to them, or you won't have the staying pattern as well. And that allowed me to probably hit two out of three of my acquisitions right, when probably 90% of my peer acquisitions failed in a big way. In fact, the best way for me to, I can say this now, that I'm unshackled and no longer tied to Cisco in any way, uh, what happened most favorable for me is when one of my competitors got bought, it almost always meant that they were going to get into trouble, and I would help them get into trouble a little bit. <laughs> yes, before I get uh, uh, Umesh and Sake to come up here, you know, in, in the book you talk about uh, uh, this trip that you took with your, with your father and uh, got caught in uh, rapids and uh, the fishing pole uh, that you held on to or he asked you to hold on to and how that's sort of been uh, your guiding force through the course of your journey at Cisco and beyond, uh, never to sort of look at fear with trepidation, but to take it on. Yes, it's, it's one of the things that I, I probably am like many of you. I had a couple years of electrical engineering, very good on numbers, etc. So I always like, give me the bottom line. What are the playbook involved? Give me the steps, etc. Uh, when you have setbacks, don't overreact to it. Determine how much was market determined, how much was otherwise. And when you have setbacks, that determines who you are in life. That doesn't help you as a startup. I've learned you've got to tell the war stories in a way that you can remember and then give the playbook. So the example was very much a lesson learned that stuck with me my whole life. Six years old, fishing with my dad in a river that was very fast, huge rapids. Mom didn't know we were out there. She would have got upset with dad. And my dad told me, don't get too close. As, as you're fishing, you fall in here. This is really dangerous rapids. Well, he went upstream a little bit. And what did I do? I fell in. And uh, it was a very, very dangerous area. And he yelled at me to hold on to the fishing pole as loud as he could. And I saw him running down the side of the river as fast as he could go. And I was getting plummeted. And I was a good swimmer. I swam the swim teams, etc. And I began to think, I could drown. And he kept yelling, hold on to the fishing pole. It was an ugly fishing pole. It might have cost $5. <laughs> uh, but I thought if he's concerned about the fishing pole, he's obviously not concerned about me drowning. So I held on to the fishing pole. And every chance I could get to the surface, I'd get a breath, and then I'd go back down. He got about 100 yards downstream, swam out, and pulled me out. And he set me on the side of the shore. And he said, John, do you know what we just did? I said, yeah, I'm about to drown. <laughs> and he said, no, uh, you made a mistake. It happens to all of us. 
you get swept away in the current, setbacks occur, but as that occur, if you fight against the current and you panic, you're liable to die or get into real trouble. What you do is be realistic about the challenge and then hold on to the fishing pole, keep calm, and then at the right time, you work your place over to the side. He then threw me back in the water, let me swim through that same spot again, and then he put me back fishing and went way upstream. But that's something I think each of you can learn from. When you have the challenges that inevitably hit you, don't swim against the tide. Be realistic how much is self-inflicted and otherwise. Pick the right point to come out and how you're going to do it differently. Then picture to your team, here's what you're going to look back like after you recover from the setback. Well, that's a great story and that is a great lesson. So let me now uh, take the opportunity to bring on your two investee companies, uh, uh, Umesh uh, from Unifor and Saket from Lucidius, both Young Turks as well. Uh, uh, we'd, we'd like you both to join us here on stage and we'll get two chairs out for you as well. Umesh, please join us on stage and Saket, good to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. Uh, both companies that John has invested in. And uh, I'm proud to say that this is, a, this is a nice Young Turk moment for us as well because both of you, uh, Young Turks, uh, have been on the show and, uh, and I'm really, really glad that, 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 that we have the two of you here joining us this morning as well. So well, you're actually the key ingredient. Shireen introduced me directly and indirectly to both of them and both of them are on 300% growth rates. So I owe you a big thanks. Thank you very much and, uh, and congratulations once again. Umesh and Saket, please. So what was it? You know, why, why did you decide to, to pick? Because Umesh was the first, and Unifor was the first investment that you did. Saket is the more recent one. Why did you decide to bet on Umesh and Unifor? First is I wanted to bet on India. And it's one thing to advise government and business leaders on the transition, but you've got to also spend time with startups and be personally involved to see what works or not. Secondly, it's that playbook. I look at the market transition going on, both business and technology. I then look at a, a CEO who can be world-class, who wants to be coached. I then go to their customers and say, what do you think of the company? And then I look at, they, are they near the inflection point, an upturn with sustainable differentiation? Each one of them hit that. Uh, on Imesh's example, their customers just were glow, you know, glowing over how good they were. And we met with them yesterday, literally 100 in the room, and all of them really are invested in his future because of the capability. So I kept the same way. It was at this session last year mm. uh, that Boeing introduced me to him. And they said, John, this concept of cybersecurity and how he's doing a assessment of where you are, but more importantly, how you protect yourself and change for the future is amazing. You've got to get to know this young CEO. So the common themes were remarkably similar. And both of them, I think, have a chance to lead not the industry here in India, but potentially globally with all the appropriate caveats. Majority of startups don't succeed, but perhaps by working together, uh, we can have two unicorns of the future. Well, we do hope that we will see two more new unicorns uh, uh, in future, but Umesh, let me ask you this. You know, since we were talking about being able to anticipate the new trends that the market is likely to throw up, not focusing so much on the competition, but focusing on the market transition, uh, give me a sense of what you've been able to achieve at Unifor and what the vision looks like for the next few years. So, uh, Shireen, first of all, like John said, thank you very much. I, I told you last year, you're my lucky charm. <laughs> you got me John Chambers, and I'm, I believe in it. Um, if you look at the market transition that we are after, and that's uh, one big part of the coaching that I've got from John in the last two years, um, all the technology that Unifor has been at, its speech recognition, AI, natural language, and now with cloud coming together, uh, it's being called conversational AI or conversational commerce. The industry that's going to get deeply impacted and disrupted is an industry that India and Malina uh, Philippines created a business model on, which was the BPOs and call centers. Mm. Now, if you look at that industry, it's a $350 billion industry, and that industry hasn't seen tremendous amount of technology change for many decades now. With chatbots and voice bots, voice analytics, voice biometrics, there's a whole new way in which customers around the world are interacting with, with machines. With Alexa and Google Home reaching our home, yeah. uh, just like how the smartphone disrupted the Nokia and the BlackBerry market, mm. and when consumers adopted the smartphone, enterprise had to follow, this voice interface is getting consumers first, and enterprise are following. And so uh, what Unifor is after is, is create the whole technology vision and the stack to enable a large enterprise like an insurance company or a bank or a, or a travel company yeah. or airline 
to be able to give their customers that new experience of the future in which the call center may not completely disappear mm. but would play a very, very diminished but a higher skilled role and rest of it is all filled by technology. And you're not looking just at India, you're looking at uh, the global play. Uh, so as of now, Unifor is in three theaters. India is home market. This is where we started. Our engineering is still in India. We went to Asia Pacific to test waters three or four years ago. did really well. Early this year, I moved to, uh, to Silicon Valley. Big reason to be close to John as well, but also potentially the biggest market. Uh, for a B2B company, um, unlike B2C, in India to be a unicorn, um, India, unfortunately, is not yet a deep market. Okay. So Indian B2B companies have to look at bigger markets like U.S. or China. And so we picked U.S. right now for our growth. Uh, so right now it's North America, uh, seven or eight countries in Asia Pacific, and India remains home market. So what's the aspiration? Give me some numbers. Uh, aspiration is last year I told oh, you. I like <laughs> we need her on our board. <laughs> All right, so your answer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sanket, don't worry, we're going to get to you in a second. Yeah, we're getting to you, Sanket. <laughs> don't smile too much. Uh, last year, Shireen, uh, you put me on the spot and asked me the same question. And I told you, potentially four years, 100 million revenue. Yeah. Uh, unicorn or not, we'll see what market gives us a valuation. We're pretty close to unicorn in that. We're tracking it. Now we're saying three years. Uh, we projected 100% growth last year. We probably would be over 200%. So we are... 200%? Uh, we are we're exceeding. The global growth has been great for us. U.S. market has been great for us. Uh, so we're still saying three years. If you're lucky, potentially two. Excellent. So you see the inflection point. I, I, can, see see, the I can see the inflection point, and that does deserve a big round of applause for being able to deliver uh, a 200% growth rate and getting closer to the 100 million uh, mark. Uh, Saket. Uh, let me come to you now, and you know, uh, this, is a, this is our own internal story. Whenever there's uh, some story related to Aadhaar or some tech crisis or whatever, Saket's our go-to guy. We call him, what's the deal with this one? And then he'll, he'll, he'll sort of drop into the office and help us, uh, help us put the story together. So Saket, thank you very much for always being there whenever we've needed you. Uh, but, you know, give me a sense of, uh, of how life has changed with this investment coming in and what does the future look like, given the fact that people are betting on security, cyber security uh, going forward? Yeah, yeah this is Ben. So uh, before I get there, 30 second part around, uh, sh and we should talk about this on why Young Turks is one of the key reasons why I got John Chambers because, uh, you know, starting from the fact that the first ever TV appearance that I personally had was Young Turks in 2013 when we were a tiny little company. We are still a small company, but, you know, at that time it was almost, you know, inexistent. And from there, I, I still remember one of the key videos that we used in our series, a pitch, and we had six term sheets. And of course, one of them who you're talking to was John, uh, was the Young Turks video that you guys shot with us. And that was the first week of Megha uh, also, uh, you know, when, when she had come down and, and shot us. So, yeah. so this, is, this is as special as it can get, Shireen. So I can't thank you enough for everything thank, that you guys thank, have done. Thank you very much. I guess, <laughs> I guess we have the ability to anticipate and spot talent before John Chambers does. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. And one of the important things, I think, for all of you to be aware of, you've got to create an ecosystem around you that you listen to advisors, et cetera, and often they're not necessarily where you would expect. Uh, Thomas Freeman, now the New York Times, a great source of information for me, or President Clinton was amazingly good on technology. You are amazingly good on these startups, and I see the pattern, and you've got to tell me who I should be investing in for this next year. <laughs> All right. We will have that conversation <laughs> offline. Okay. Yes, so, I can. So, so the question around how life has changed with John. Uh, you see, I'm in, the, I'm in the business of trust, because cybersecurity is about assurance, about uh, we, we truly believe that the world, the way it changed in the last 20 years, in the same pace it would be changing in the next three to five years because the speed is going up as you move forward and the ingredient is technology. And the technology is no longer enterprise or office automation. It's actually touching our lives professionally, personally, in every dimension, in every vertical you can think of. And when technology becomes so crucial as a centerpiece of everything that we are doing, security of technology is almost as crucial as the security of your own personal self. Mm. And when that happens, and that's the market transition we are talking about, where security becomes a fundamental uh, thing to think while digitally transforming an enterprise or a personal person going online, uh, seeing security in a quantitative manner 
in a way you can understand and yeah. you don't need to be a cyber scientist to understand that becomes very crucial a simple example if you are you're using your cell phones if I asked you how secured are your cell phones uh, you know you, you would not have an answer to that but if I asked you uh, how much battery do you have on your cell phone you have an objective real-time answer to that mm. so that's what we cracked and that's what our focus has been that when you look at cyber security how do you make it mathematical understandable and the way you get a hemoglobin report by a doctor and and you don't need to be a doctor to to read that report yeah. you just get the number in the range and the moment you do that you know how how safe you are or how, how good the count is mm. uh, that's what we cracked we were first of our first of its kind in the world and that needs to happen in a real-time basis across 100 percent tech stacks so that's what we got and getting John on board is the biggest validation which we can ever get because that is the most credible name out there who not only understands the internet but has built the internet who has really changed the way the entire humanity lives plays works and learns and 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 what better validation than that so 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 Shereen, all of my conversations have changed ever since John came in so well yeah. I, and I hope you're having plenty of good conversations but to which let me come back to you now you know uh, at the inflection point that John pointed out, you're, you find yourself at, and you find the company uh, sort of now clipping closer to the 100 million mark and, and beyond. What are the key challenges that you're grappling with today? What would you say are the top three priorities that you need to focus on and the key challenges that you face? So, um, uh, clearly as the inflection point is, is happening and we're seeing it with our customers, for the first time, whether it's a Fortune 5 company, a Fortune 10 company, we used to think get, getting into Fortune 500 is hard, but as we take our products to them in the US or in Singapore or in India, we are finding immediate reaction and we are finding immediate de uh, deployment opportunities and large orders, uh, orders larger than we've ever seen. Uh, and so the biggest challenge, therefore, in my mind, has shifted this year to say uh, market coverage. We have a window of opportunity. Our products seem to be unique. Clearly, customers are validating. They have the option of buying from any large player in the world. But as soon as our product is shown, the differentiation is clear. And so it's, uh, it's now about how fast can we scale and do the market coverage. Because if there's a window, it won't be too long before somebody else gets in. Uh, which is when having a mentor like John is tremendously great because he's seen this movie one too many times. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> And so, you know, uh, what kind of investments, in which markets, uh, what kind of teams and people do you bring in? Uh, people who've seen this in larger organization, but now can also build a startup to that large organization. The second is, uh, while our technology is differentiated, there's a lot of AI uh, application that we've done over the last two to three years. How do we make sure that over the next two to three years it remains that way? Mm. We, uh, we now have you know, better funding, our, our balance sheet is bigger. How do we make sure that the percentage of R&D remains the same, which means we are investing even more in, in being the bleeding edge and being the cutting edge and probably defining the new customer service, mm. just like 20, 25 years ago, India and Philippines defined uh, customer service through call centers to be the company which now redefines what customer service would mean. But I would point out that just like everything in life, there's tremendous positives to having a mentor and investor like John Chambers. There are some things which could hurt as well. Okay, uh, let, let's talk about that. What's, <laughs> what's hurting? What, what, are the pain, what are the pain points of having John Chambers as an investor? So it's taken me two years from, from being uh, dreamy-eyed about having John Chambers pick me as his first Indian investment, mentor me, coach me, spend time with me and my team, and then finally earlier this year and said, uh, Umesh, I know you moved to the U.S., I want you to be frugal and fly with me in my plane when I go to India. Oh. And I said, um, uh, John, I'll be frugal all year long. Uh, I love it. This time when we flew with uh, John on the plane, he talks about you are luckier when you're better prepared, right? I didn't realize what he meant until, until I was on the plane. It was a 16-hour flight. In a commercial flight, when you go to the U.S. or coming back, what do we do? We sleep for yeah. six or eight hours. Yeah. When the big boss wants to get prepared for 14 out of the 16 hours, you can't sleep. <laughs> and so... <laughs> So he was shooting questions your way on a 16-hour flight. All the meetings this week that he had or I had with my customers, I've known these people for years, but we had to go through each one in detail. What are we going to say? What happened in the past? What are the hot buttons that we shouldn't go to? It took 14 hours. And then he said, let's get two hours of sleep before we land in <laughs> <laughs> how, how kind of you, John. How very kind of you, Sakit. Uh, have you been up for 14 hours at a stretch as well? <laughs> well, I, I haven't flown for 14 hours, but one thing I can share with you is I flew with John to this, this 
one of its experience where we went to Alaska, where John took uh, 12 of us uh, as the CEOs who he has invested money in. And he had 12 of the senior most executives on the planet who are not only who've been there, done that, achieved everything, but most importantly were one of some of the most amazing human beings mm -hmm. a person could ever meet. And you know what he does? So we go to Alaska and we all went in his plane. That, that's where it started. And, and we go fishing. And we go to a place where there's no internet, there's no cell phone connectivity, and you're for, there for eight days. And these super senior people are stuck with these... Uh, you know, young CEOs who are bombarding with them with every question you can think of. And, 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 and the funny thing is we go fishing every day where, you know, you're basically in fishing, you're two people and there's a guide yeah, yeah. and you're, you're on a boat for four hours. Yeah. So what do you do? You basically make friends for life. And, and, and for us, they become mentors for life. And people who have seen that and, and been there, the ecosystem that John bring, brings in to the point where John might not like it, I believe, is even far more greater than, than, than the money John he brings just, in. <laughs> money is probably the, money yeah. is probably the fifth of the, on the list of what he yeah. brings in. I yeah. said in Young Turks last year uh, when we met in Hyderabad together, John doesn't know I would have given him the shares for free. <laughs> He paid money for it. Exactly. <laughs> I double that. <laughs> okay. So, so let me, so, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. So uh, uh, let me get uh, both Saket and Umesh to give us uh, a forward-looking statement. You're, you're not listed yet, so you can, you can give us guidance without having to worry about anybody coming your way. Uh, a forward-looking statement, Umesh, I'll start by asking you, what's the vision over the next five years? Where do you see Unifor? Uh, five years. Uh, redefining customer service as we know it through bots, through analytics, and through AI across the world with every large enterprise or back office BPO uh, adopting the new technology stack. Uh, three years uh, or probably faster to 100 million, and next two years we'll see where we go from there. Well, we wish you the very best of luck. Thank you. Mine is simple, just to try and champion this market transition where we are able to go ahead and become the de facto standard of helping everybody at the enterprise level or at the consumer level in helping you protect your digital identity, digital presence. And, and if that happens, the byproduct can be, you know, whatever numbers. What, what, whatever numbers. Well, we wish you the very best of luck with the whatever numbers, Saket. John Chambers, uh, you said uh, you're going to be back in spring looking for the next crop of Indian entrepreneurs. What are you going to be looking for? It comes back. Whoa. It comes back to what I would encourage each of you to focus on. Focus on the market transition. Focus on your differentiation. Focus on a CEO and a leadership team who knows what they know and knows what they don't. Build a customer set, whether it's your consumers and your uh, uh, path to market or your enterprise customers that truly want you to be successful and they will bet their future on you. And then really focus on the inflection point. Don't spend the money too early. But when the inflection point hits, put the pedal all the way down. But leaving you with the same comment I started with, this country has a chance to leapfrog the world. Your education system, your IITs are amazingly good. We need to find a way to get it across to all 29 states, not just six of them. But you need to be the role model for the rest of the world on how do you transform a country with all the benefits we talked about. I believe in you all, but I really want to put the pressure on you to see how many unicorns, which is where you get job creation, and how many IPOs you can do. But if I were betting on one country and one group of startups, it would be you. Well, the pressure is on this room now, John Chambers. Thank you very much for joining us here at the Young Turks Conclave. Ubesh and Saket, appreciate your time as well. We wish all of you the very best of luck. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. John Chambers, Ubesh and Saket Modi. I would now uh, like to request Shireen to hand out a token of appreciation from our bespoke partner, Damilano, and gift partner, Just Herb. Ladies and gentlemen, on the sidelines of the conclave, we are hosting our Young Turks Masterclass session. It is a, a platform that we formalized earlier this year. In fact, we...